Seeing Stars in Hollywood with Peg Murray, Ozzie Nelson, Harriet Hillier. Seeing Stars in Hollywood, the Baker's Broadcast, presented by the makers of Fleischmann's Yeast in behalf of the 30,000 bakers in the United States and Canada, with Peg Murray, whose cartoon feature Seeing Stars is syndicated all over the world. Ozzie Nelson and his orchestra, Harriet Hillier. Tonight, as Peg's guest, Ralph Bellamy and Zazu Pitt. Oh, dear me. the old seeing stars of sun. Enter without cap and gown, Professor Peg Murray. You know, Ozzy, almost every actor in Hollywood at some time or other has complained about typecasting, being given the same type of role in picture after picture. Not so long ago, Verna Loy was doing fairly well playing nothing but oriental sirens with oily skin and slanty eyes. Then William K. Howard, the producer, offered her the part of an ordinary American girl in the picture Transatlantic. She was an, an immediate hit, and now... And now she's typecast as William Powell's wife. Bill Powell's wife? Nice typecasting, if you can get. Speaking of Bill Powell, remember a picture called When Knighthood Was in Flower? Oh, yeah, that was one of the best pictures of the year 1900 and... 1920 yeah. would be more correct. Well, in that picture, Bill Powell was playing his usual role in those days, the villain. So Myrna Loy used to be a siren, and William Powell used to be a villain. Yeah, and now they're having a double wedding. Yes, and did you know that Wallace Beery used to be a female impersonator? Female impersonator? He must have looked cute. He did. It was in a series of comedies, and Beery played a Swedish servant girl. At other times... He became typed as a heavy and as a comedian. Now, Fig, you wouldn't call that typecasting, would you? Looks as if Wally's played everything. Well, he's changed his character a few times. I mean, each time has lasted several years. I saw Deanna Durbin's new picture, 100 Men and a Girl, the other night. And if that Leopold Spikowski doesn't watch out, he's going to be typed as an orchestra leader. That's one thing you'll never have to worry about, dear. Ouch. <laughs> Say, Fig, what about Johnny Weissmuller? Will he ever play anything but Tarzan? I don't know about that. But in his next picture, Johnny Weissmuller will talk more than a couple of words for the first time on the screen. Oh, Tarzan talk? Oh, Ozzy, if you could only swim. Well, it's sink or swim with a lot of those who squawk at being molded to type out here. Well, do you think typecasting is a bad thing, Fag? Each case is different. Take Ralph Bellamy. When he was on the stage, Ralph played some 375 different roles, ranging from Shakespeare to Simon McGree. But until recently, he has been given very little opportunity to play anything in Hollywood but the more dashing and nondescript heroes. He, I think, ought to be able to give us the lowdown on the situation. Meet Ralph Bellamy. (laughs) 
You know, Fig, I can't get over the fact that that's little Harriet Hilliard. What do you mean, little? Well, you were little when I saw you in St. Joe, Missouri. Hey, what goes on here? Harriet's father, Roy Hilliard, was directing a stock company I was with in St. Joe. And Harriet, who must have been all of 12 years old, trundled up from a girls' school in Kansas City to see him. That's the first and last time I ever saw Harriet Hilliard. I remember. Daddy had an awfully cute leading man in that company. Who was he? <laughs> A guy named Bellamy. He was cute, wasn't he? Ducky. Well, Ducky, what is your opinion of this casting business? Well, Feggy Weggy, I'll tell you. <laughs> There's a stream up near Arrowhead that a few of us know about, and if you promise not to tell anybody, I'll guarantee you the finest mess of mountain Just a minute. Is... No, just a minute, boy. I'm not talking about fly casting. It's type casting. We're interested. Oh, that. Yes, that. I see. Well, as a matter of fact, typecasting isn't as bad as it's been painted. But now about this trout stream. Yeah, I used to be something of a fisherman myself. I used to use worms. Use worms? For trout, Ozzy? Yeah, for anything. Well, it's not sporting. It may not be sporting, but you catch a lot of fish. <laughs> if we can just get your minds off the subject of fishing for a minute and take up the business at hand. Yes, what was that about typecasting not being as bad as, as it's painted? Well, Harriet, it's better than not being cast at all. Believe me, I know. I've been on both sides of the fence. When I first came out here, I had a contract that guaranteed me 30 weeks work out of 52 weeks. That left a 22-week layoff without pay. I was full of hope, ideas, ideals, you know. What happened? Nothing, Ozzy. I served the 22 weeks without pay first. Then when it came time for me to do the 30 working weeks, I got canned. <laughs> out on your ear, hey? <laughs> out on your ear, hey? Well, you can call it my ear if you want to be polite. I catch. <laughs> Seriously, Ralph, don't you think there's a limit to this business of casting an actor into a mold? Sure I do. So does every actor. I know I got pretty sick of playing those nondescript heroes you talked about. But once I was a gangster, though. You were? I don't remember that. Sure, it was in the first picture I ever made. The Secret Six was the name of it. And I was the complete gun guy with pearl gray hat, blue serge suit, and even a scar. The Wallace Beery, who was playing heavies then, shot me in the back and took my mob away from me. <laughs> when was that, Ralph? Oh, about halfway through the third reel. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean, what year was it? <laughs> oh. Well, my first picture was in 1930. Well, what brought you to Hollywood, Ralph? I came via roadside. You mean you summed your way out? <laughs> no. Roadside was the name of the play I was doing. My first big hit on Broadway. How long did it run? The usual two weeks. <laughs> a job that only lasted two weeks doesn't sound like much of a big break to me. Any job is a break if you've only got three bucks in your pocket. And that's how broke I was. Anyway, it brought me to Hollywood, and in a little while I was in the movies, all ready to be typecast. And since then, you've been cast as just another fellow. A couple of other fellows, Peg, if you don't mind an actor digging for an old one. Then... I know. Then along came the awful truth, and they gave you the part originally set for Roland Young. That doesn't sound like typecasting to me. It wasn't. It was a comedy, and I was playing a different type at last. And I understand from the lucky guys who saw the preview that you got quite a few of those chuckles. Chuckles, I hear they were real Bellamy laughs. <laughs> well, anyway, the first day, Leo McCary asked me if I could sing. I said, no. Can you carry a tune, he said. Not very well. Swell, that's just what I want, said McCary. In this scene, you sing Home on the Range with Irene Dunn. I looked at him and said, oh, no, I don't. So? So what? So I sang. <laughs> and if you've ever heard me sing, you know that's not typecasting. Well, I don't know anything about your singing, Ralph, but how did they happen to let you play the Roland Young part? You're not English. They changed the character to an Oklahoman. As a matter of fact, when they first sent me the script, they sent a note along with it. What did the note say? Don't learn it. It's still in English. <laughs> you know, Fig, I don't see why actors should complain about being typecast as long as that little man comes around with the check every week. Well, for the benefit of people like yourself, Ozzy... We have prepared three plays to demonstrate the question at hand. Ralph Bellamy appears as a man, and one of our greatest character actresses as the woman. This is Typecast. Play number one, the nineteenth woman with an all-star cast. Scene: a packed courtroom. Debonair, dashing District Attorney McGurk opens his cross-examination of frail, poignant, wistful Penelope Worthington. 
Penelope Worthington, the people of this great city have brought you to trial accused of the murder of one Anthony Wolfe on the night of January 6th last. Upon me is fallen the duty of seeing that justice is done. You will therefore receive all the consideration that I can possibly give you, for you are, in the eyes of this court and of the world, innocent until proven guilty. But, did you or did you not kill Anthony Wolfe? Oh, dear me. Play number two, the 19th chair with an all-star cast. Scene, a courtroom. Tense, tight-lipped District Attorney McCarthy begins cross-examination of worldly, weary, beautiful Priscilla Wood. In the eyes of the world, innocent until proven guilty. But did you or did you not kill Jackson Darnell on the night of February 6th? Oh, dear me. Play number three, the 19th hole with an all-star cast. Scene... Did you or did you not... Oh, dear me. <laughs> In those three exciting slices of life, we had, as you probably realize now, the one and only Zazu Pitts playing the part of the witness. Thank you, Ralph Bellamy, and thank you, too, Zazu Pitts. We'll see if you can say more than, oh, dear me, a little later on. Okay, Ozzy. So, oh, Harry, did you like that? Oh, Ozzy, you know, I thought that little drama was really thrilling. Well, of course, you're a bit naive, you know. As a matter of fact, hasn't anyone ever told you what life is all about? It's strange that you should be so self-contained. Why, you're afraid to display emotion. And so I have no doubt that certain facts will have to be explained. When a bird, young and free, hangs around a certain tree, singing serenades that tell his love is true, that's because... It's the natural thing to do When a sad moonstruck cow Would be glad to make a vow When she lifts her head And sighs a lonely moon That's because It's the natural thing to do And you know every dove Has its heart set on love Squirrels too, and they should And you know a woodchuck would When a boy such as I Tries so hard to qualify With a very lovely lady Such as you And you see It's the natural thing to do When the girl acts demure and the boy feels proud and sure And impulsively suggests a rendezvous That's because it's a natural thing to do But the girl won't agree Though he begs on bended knee Then she runs away and knows that he'll pursue That's because it's the natural thing to do Then the boy in despair Waves his arms and tears his hair Stamps his feet and acts like mad That's because he's got it bad Then the girl ought to fall If she's got a heart at all She should take him in her arms and kiss him too And you know that's the natural thing to do Down through the ages, the countries that have won the most battles and the men who have done the greatest things have been the bread eaters. At times, bread has even been credited with having supernatural powers. But now, at last, we have the scientific facts about the staff of life. The result of three years of research at leading American universities. They are facts of importance to every family, regardless of income. For example, everyone should know that bread is one of our most important sources of protein. Proteins used by your body to build and maintain muscle tissue. Also, that bread is the best all-around energy food we have. It gives sustained energy. It gives you energy to be active, to get things done, to keep going. And people concerned about their weight should know this about bread. Scientific tests show that bread makes reducing safer. It holds up your strength and keeps your muscles firm. Also, it helps to burn up completely the fat you lose. And so helps protect you against acidosis. If you want to cut down your weight without hurting your health, Follow the new bread diet. 
On the bread diet, you go light on fats, sugars, and foods that are practically all starch. You eat fruits, green vegetables, milk, and lean meat. And to stay energetic and to keep your muscles firm and strong while you reduce, you eat bread with each meal. Whether you're dieting or not, make bread a part of every meal. From the motion picture Blossoms on Broadway, Harriet sings. There are blossoms on Broadway when I'm walking with you. Blossoms where trees never grew. I forget the crowd and the loud rumble of cars and all the bright lights. Turn into stars There is magic on Broadway When you're smiling at me Magic my heart never knew What a joy to be blissfully Wandering through The blossoms on Broadway Did you know that before the days of the talkies, Zazu Pitts was a tragedian and a great one? But since they put sound on film, all her roles have been plaintive comedy characterizations. She has had plenty of imitators, but there is only one Zazu Pitts. I should think one would be enough. <laughs> Zazu, just what is it about the way you say, oh dear me, that makes it a funny line? I don't know. But I wish that whatever it is, it wasn't. <laughs> you don't mean to say that you mind saying, Oh, dear me. Oh, <laughs> if you don't mind, Harriet, that wasn't quite right. No? No? No, it's sort of, Oh, dear me. Oh, dear me, there I go again. <laughs> well, what's wrong about that? Everything's wrong about it, Sage. You talk about being typecast. How would you like to be typecast for three words? <laughs> I think that'd be very funny myself. Hmm, you do. Well, fun's fun, but a girl can't laugh all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night saying, oh, well, uh, saying it. Uh, people come up to me in the street and say it. Zazu, just what has changed you from playing tragedy to comedy, anyway? I don't think it was what. I think it was they. They? Yes, they, they. They all laugh when I sat down to play tragedy. I don't know about that. I remember seeing you in the tragedy greed back in the silent days. And believe me, you didn't hand me any laughs. And I didn't hand any to myself either. Maybe that was the trouble. You mean that you couldn't laugh at yourself in a tragic part? I mean I couldn't laugh at all? It took a year to make greed and all I did was cry. For one year I cried steadily. I guess I was used up all my tears. Greed was a kind of super colossal at that. 24 reels. It ran hours. Yes, I guess it was an epic. An epic of tears. And after it was finished... Yes? 
Well, Cry Baby Pitts never rode again. <laughs> what we're trying to get at is what made you change from tragedy to comedy? Did you or did you not? Hmm, District Attorney McGirt. <laughs> well, I really don't know, Fag. Maybe it was my voice. Your voice? Yes, Harriet. I know I laughed the first time I heard it. I just sat in the projection room and said, My goodness, did that come out of me? <laughs> well, did it? Well, that's what they told me. Anyway, after the first talking picture, I was in. The rest is history. Zazu was an immediate comedy smash, and from then on she was typed. Typed in the minds of the producers and directors, but even more so in the minds of the public. On one memorable occasion, she played a role similar to the one she did before sound. It was in Universal's great picture of a few seasons back, all quiet on the Western Front. Zazu was cast as the weary, war-tired mother of the young soldier Paul, and she did a superlative job. But just as soon as her picture was flashed on the screen at a sneak preview, the audience laughed because they expected comedy. Back went all quiet to the studio for retakes, and another actress was given her part. Tonight we have a very unusual treat, a great dramatic performance that only a handful of people ever saw because it was left on the cutting room floor. Zazel Pitts plays for us that deeply tender scene that was taken out of all quiet on the Western Front. Will you set the stage, John Heathen? <laughs> War-torn Germany. In the trenches, death and the piteous cries of the wounded. At home, slow starvation and fear. Fear for the safety of the husbands, sweethearts, brothers and sons in the front lines. Paul Baumer, two years ago, a carefree young high school lad, now at 18, a bitter, disillusioned veteran, returns home on short leave to find his mother weak for lack of food, desperately ill. He enters her room. Mother. Paul, you've come back. No, Mother. I'm not wounded. I just got leave until tomorrow. Aren't you happy? Happy? Look, Paul, I'm crying. Here I lie and cry instead of being glad. Oh, I'm a silly one. We'll have to get down that jar of blackberries. You still like them, don't you, Paul? Yes, Mother. I haven't had any for a long time. I know. Oh, sit down beside me, my baby. Paul. Yes, Mother? What's the matter? Have you been away so long that, that we're strangers? Strangers? How could we be strangers? Look, Mother, I, I've got some little presents for you. From the trenches. Some cheese, sausage, some bread. Three quarters of a pound of butter. Real butter, Mother. Paul, you, you've been starving yourself out there. Well, don't you believe it? These were extra. Is it, is it pretty hard to get food here at home? There isn't much. Do they give the soldiers enough to eat? Yes. We have enough. Is it very bad out there, Paul? No. Not so very. There's, there's always a lot of us together, so... It isn't so bad. Are you sure? Yes, Mother. Well, the Muller boys said it was awful. Is, is Muller here now? Yes, and he's wounded. I know. And he says that gas and all those things are terrible. Oh, that that's just talk. But what about me? Look at me. Have you ever seen me looking better? Oh, no, Paul. Here, help me up. Oh, Mother... Don't get up. Oh, I must. I want to get to some of that blackberry jam. Oh, no, no, you mustn't. You'll catch cold. Besides, it's just late. I'll lie back in bed. Go to sleep. There'll be plenty of time to sleep when you're gone. Must you go tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. Are you very much afraid, Paul? No, Mother. There's something I want to ask you. Oh, please be careful at the front, Paul. Yes, I will. I promise I will. And I'll pray for you every day. Oh, Paul, if you could only get a job that's not so dangerous. Could you? I'll try. Mother. Mother. Just think I'm a child. Why can't I put my head in your lap? Cry. 
What, what did you say, Paul? Oh, it was nothing. Now you lie back. And... I... I... Good night, mother. Goodbye, my son. Thank you, Zazel. You know, after hearing that, I'd like to see you do more parts like it. Uh, would you really say? You bet I would. Oh, dear me. Hang around, folks, while we give out with a little barnyard jazz. Subject is Josephine. Was the gal I could love like I love my Josephine? She's the flirt, she's the scamp, she's the vampiest vamp I've ever seen. It seems to me she's always a flirting with the fellows passing by. But when I say she winks, then she tells me she thinks there's a cinder in her eye. I believe it would be better if I'd leave her and forget. Everybody says it would be wise. But each time I go out to dance with somebody else, I find myself dancing with tears in my eyes. Nobody's quite so nice. Who can I be quite so mean as my gal? What a gal, a Josephine. They do everything up brown. The business of eating is no exception. Nobody knows that better than the man we present now, head chef of the executive dining room of Columbia Pictures, Andy Anderson. From all reports, Andy, you really dish it up in elegant style to the big shots over on the Columbia lot. But suppose you had to feed a gang like that on a limited budget. Do you have any ideas on the economy side to pass along to housewives? Sure, plenty. Well, for instance, uh... I'd make... My meat go harder by serving more bread with it. Oh, you mean you'd give your family more meat sandwiches? Yes, I'd serve more bread stuffing with meat. Not only with lamb, pork, and veal, but roast beef, too. You know, you don't have to stuff the meat. You can put the dressing alongside the roast and base it at your base to meat. Well, that sounds like a very practical suggestion. Now, how about giving us an opinion on some butterfly buns? We have a box right here. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. There you are. Take a bite of that. Butterfly buns like these are being featured by bakers all over the country this week. Most bakers follow the same famous recipe with plenty of cinnamon, sugar, and nuts or big juicy raisins and with vanilla icing like that on top. Yes, this bun is very good. The texture is just right, light and fine, the way it should be. Yes, sir, a special on buns like this is something. It's a fine thing for the ladies and their families, too. Well, thank you very, very much, Abby. I'm sure many housewives will follow your tip and take advantage of this week's special on butterfly buns. I want to remind the ladies, too, about the Baker's Cake of the Month for November. It's delicious white layer cake, iced on top and between the layers, and sold at a price below what it would cost you to bake it yourself. Treat your family to a white layer cake and some butterfly buns early this week. Next Sunday, Peg Murray presents more interesting sidelights on Hollywood. He'll bring with him two of Hollywood's favorite citizens, the beloved Mae Robeson and Charles Richards. 
casting director of Selznick International Studios, producer of the smash hit The Prisoner of Zenda. Of course, Harriet Hilliard and Ozzie Nelson and the orchestra will be around too. So don't forget, next Sunday, Charles Richards and May Robeson. All Quiet on the Western Front was produced by Universal Pictures, producers of The World Back, Jerry Go Round of 1938, and Doris Sweetheart. Heard this evening was the financial thing to do for Governor Nothing. John Heaton speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.